Hi guys, this is the second of four short videos where I'm going to walk you through some AWS certified cloud practitioner questions. So these are from my practice test course where we have recently released hundreds of new questions and updated questions. So let's go through these questions. Now the first one is under the AWS shared responsibility model, what are examples of shared controls? So with the AWS shared responsibility model, this is about defining who has responsibility for what. So between the AWS as the cloud provider and the customer as the user or consumer of the cloud services. So in that case, there are some controls which are AWS responsibility only and some that are customer responsibility only, but there are some that are shared controls. So let's have a look at what are shared controls. So the first one is patch management. So is that a shared control? Well, actually, yes, it is. So the underlying physical infrastructure, so the servers, the, the routers and the switches and so on, and the storage servers, all that kind of stuff, is AWS's responsibility. And of course, there's patch management that needs to be performed on those systems. But at your level as an AWS customer, you might have EC2 instances, for instance. And with an EC2 instance, you manage the operating system, so Linux or Windows. And it's your responsibility, therefore, to manage the patches, the updates to those operating systems. And then you've got your application sitting on top as well. So you've got to patch manage your applications as well. So I'm going to select that one. I believe that's a correct option. The next one is storage system patching. Well, here is where I'm referring to before. It's the underlying physical infrastructure, so the storage servers. So as a customer, you don't have responsibility for that, so it's not a shared control. Next up, we have physical and environmental. Well, with this, I'm thinking it's, it's referring to the electricity, you know, the air conditioning in the data center, the, you know, the redundant power and all that kind of thing, the physical data center as well that the services are running from. So that's not really a customer responsibility. That's an AWS responsibility, so it's not shared. Then we have configuration management. Well, AWS have configuration management for their own systems. So what we're talking about with configuration management is as any user of IT services, you need to record the configuration of your systems. And this helps you to understand how they're built and how they're operating. And when you make changes, it's something that you can reference and say, well, I changed it from this configuration to this configuration, and this is what happened. So it's good for keeping control as well over changes that you make to your environment and reducing risk. Now, AWS definitely have responsibility for configuration management for their systems. So the underlying infrastructure, the servers, the storage, the networking, and so on. But you also have responsibility for configuration management because you have applications and services running on AWS, and it's up to you to, configure, to, to manage configuration management for those services. So I believe that's another correct answer because that's a shared control. We then have service and communications protection. Well, this is more of a customer responsibility. So I don't think it's a shared responsibility. And it's talking about things like setting up um, protected networks and you know isolated networks and encrypting your traffic and that kind of thing. So it's not an AWS responsibility. So I believe we've got patch management as a shared control and configuration management as a shared control. So let's click on check. And sure enough, those are the correct answers. And we've got a bit more information here on these different areas to help you understand it better. So let's click on next and get to the next question. So the next question reads, which service provides visibility into user activity by recording actions taken on your account? Now let's first visit what an action is. So AWS is Amazon Web Services. So the web services thing sort of gives it away a bit. Everything in AWS is a web service, and that means that you can interact with it, control it, and perform actions against it using a REST API. Now, that basically means you can structure a URL with HTTP, and you can use that to actually perform changes and perhaps launch an EC2 instance or modify a database, that kind of thing. So what actually happens when you're performing an action is you as a user are making an API call. Now you might be doing it programmatically or you might be doing it through the management console, but either way behind that, there's gonna be a API call made. And the service that actually records API calls 
is CloudTrail. So it's an auditing service and it monitors who is doing what. At, you know, so you can record what happened at a specific time. So who performed what action? Who launched an EC2 instance? Who terminated an instance? So whenever you see something like this that's asking for user activity and actions, think about auditing and then that should take you straight to CloudTrail. So again, what I often do is just choose what I think is the right answer because it stands out to me immediately. And then I want to go through at the other answers and just check and make sure that I'm not missing something. So the top answer is Amazon CloudWatch. And CloudWatch is about performance monitoring. So it's not auditing. It's more about gathering metrics on the performance of your systems, how much CPU you're using, how much memory, that kind of thing. So CloudWatch is not for auditing. So I'm definitely going to rule that one out. Then got cloud formation. Well, this is a really cool tool that you can use for building out infrastructures. So it automates the creation of your resources using a template. So that's definitely not about auditing. And lastly, at the bottom, we've got Amazon Cloud HSM. So Cloud HSM, the HSM stands for Hardware Security Module. And it's a service that you can use to create and manage encryption keys. So it's a cryptographic service. It's not about auditing or actions that are being taken. So I'm pretty sure it's CloudTrail. Let's click on check. And that's the correct answer. So let's move on to another one. Which AWS service can you use to install a third party database? Now by third party, I take it to mean that it's not going to be one of the RDS engines. So for instance, it's not going to be RDS MySQL or RDS MariaDB because that wouldn't be third party, that would be a AWS implementation. So Amazon RDS is a managed service for running relational databases. And you can choose the engine, but I'm definitely thinking that it's the question is trying to rule out using one of those engines on RDS. So the next one is DynamoDB. Well, with DynamoDB, you don't have any choice to install a database. In fact, you don't with RDS either. You choose your engine, but you don't install anything. And with DynamoDB, you actually consume tables. So it's a database that already exists. You create a table on it, and then you populate that table with your data. So that's going to be an incorrect answer as well. Then we've got Amazon EC2. Well, with EC2, you've got an operating system. It could be Linux or Windows. And you can basically do whatever you want on that. So you can indeed install whatever third-party database is supported by your operating system. So that looks to me like the correct answer. And let's just check the last one to be sure. The last one is Amazon EMR, which is the Elastic MapReduce. Now this is a Hadoop service. So it's all about analytics and analyzing data. So I'm pretty sure that EMR is not where you would install a third party database because it has its own database engine. So let's click on check. So that answer is correct. Let's move on to one more. Which service can be used for building and integrating loosely coupled distributed applications? So in the last video, we actually talked about a loosely coupled distributed application as well. And the answer then was SQS. But if you might remember that there's another service which is often associated with loose coupling, and that's the simple notification service. And the reason being is what SNS does is allows you to send notifications between services. So you might have an application component that performs data gathering of some sort and then a processing tier. And you can send a notification and that notification might have the payload which includes some important data that needs to be processed. So you can definitely loosely couple uh, a distributed application with SNS. So again, sometimes these really stand out and I think a good way of doing it is just to choose the answer that you think is correct and then just establish and make sure that your thinking is correct. So let's look at EBS. Well, that's the Elastic Block Store. It's a block storage system. So it's what you attach to an EC2 instance. You attach a volume, an EBS volume to an EC2 instance and you can install, uh, store your data on it. So that's a block storage system. It's nothing to do with loose coupling. We then got the Elastic File System. So that's another service that you can use with EC2 and it allows you to have a hosted file system, so a managed file system. So rather than a block storage where you have a volume you attach, with EFS you mount a file system and you can share it amongst multiple instances. So again, it's not about loose coupling, it's more about shared access to a single file system. And lastly, we have the Amazon RDS, the Relational Database Service. 
And that's for running databases. So you might choose to run a, a MariaDB database, a PostgreSQL or a MySQL or Microsoft SQL. So you can use those different database engines on Amazon RDS and also the proprietary AWS engine, which is called Aurora. So that's definitely not what we're looking at here because we're looking at loose coupling, not a database. So I'm pretty sure it's SNS. Let's click on check. And sure enough, that's the correct answer. So for one last question, let's go forward. And it says, which service allows you to automatically expand and shrink your application in response to demand? So remember, one of the key benefits of the cloud is that you can elastically scale. And that means that your application you know, might have a certain level of traffic one day, but then maybe that increases when you have a sale and you wanna be able to elastically scale that application. And there's a couple of components to how this works. So firstly, you need a way to change the amount of resources assigned to your application. Now with the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, so EC2, the way you do that is with Amazon EC2 auto scaling. So you create an auto scaling group and you say, maybe I wanna run four instances. But I also specify that if the CPU usage of those instances goes up above 80%, then I want you to add another instance. And so as the application becomes busier, it's gonna launch more instances. And then if the application becomes less busy, less traffic, then it's going to terminate instances. So that's automatically expanding and shrinking the application in response to the amount of demand, so the amount of traffic. And there's a few ways you can measure it, CPU is one. The other thing you need to do as you elastically scale your application is direct your traffic to the instances. So you've got more instances, but you need a way to direct the traffic to them. And that's where elastic load balancing comes in. So both of these are on the page, but auto scaling is how you expand and shrink. Elastic load balancing is how you send your traffic to those instances. So you might spread the traffic across your instances. So in this case, I believe auto scaling is the correct answer. And I've already ruled out elastic load balancing. So let's look at the others. So we've got Elastacache. Well, Elastacache is an in-memory database. So again, it's nothing to do with expanding and shrinking an application, but it is to do with sort of caching data so that your reads from your database are faster. And then we've got DynamoDB, which is a non-relational database. So again, that doesn't have anything to do with expanding and shrinking. It is a service which can automatically scale. And the great thing about DynamoDB is it does it without downtime as well. So it can scale kind of horizontally. That means it can sort of scale by adding more resources, but without you needing to change like an instance type like you would with another service like Elastacache. So definitely auto scaling is the correct answer here. Let's click on check. And sure enough, that's the correct answer. So I hope you enjoyed that guys and I'll hopefully see you in another video shortly.